Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Ensuring Quality User Experiences on a Budget, Why SNS Worldwide Switched from Gomez to Alert Site for Web Monitoring. Today's speakers are Carrie Coy, Director of Web and Technical Services at SNS Worldwide, and Ken Godskin, VP of Monitoring Products for Alert Site at SmartBear. Today's presentation will be approximately 35 minutes long to allow some time for Q&A at the end. If you have questions during the presentation, please type them into the GoToWebinar chat window, and we'll do our best to address them all um, during the session. Any questions requiring individual follow-up uh, will be addressed individually by email or phone. We'll start today with some speaker introductions, and then Carrie will talk about the recent relaunch of SNSWorldwide.com. She will talk about how and what you should monitor pre and post launch. Then Carrie and Ken will talk about important pages and transactions to monitor and how easy it is to do that with our recording tool. Next, we'll address the importance of being able to objectively understand third-party vendor performance so you can effectively manage SLAs. Lastly, we'll talk about new metrics for measuring the way your users perceive performance and how that differs from traditional performance metrics. We'll tie everything together with a review of best practices and then go to Q&A. Without further ado, I will turn things over to Carrie. Hi, everybody. Um, my company, SNS Worldwide, has been family-owned for over 100 years. Um, our co-presidents are actually grandsons of our founder. Um, we sell craft supplies, games, uh, physical education equipment, and therapy products to schools and hospitals and recreation departments. Uh, for our first 95 years or so, we were basically a direct marketer cataloger. And in the past dozen years, um, we've become a multi-channel merchant. Uh, we mail more than 4 million catalogs a year, and we do close to half our business now online over the Internet. Um, we're a 10-person IT shop, but we only have one full-time person dedicated to web development. Um, you can see from the metrics on this slide that we, we have a long history of relying on metrics to make sure things are running smoothly, and we do review them together frequently. And I would say everybody in our company feels a sense of ownership in our customer satisfaction rates and our ship rates and our back order rates, even if we don't personally control those metrics. But organizationally, online metrics are kind of still working their way into our vernacular terms like bounce rate, conversion rate, unique views. Um, one of my personal goals is to sort of operationalize response time metrics and the language of response time metrics so that they have the same visibility as our more traditional measures of success. Because obviously how fast our website page loads is equally as important as how fast a catalog lands in somebody's mailbox. Um, and I would say that's probably why we kind of long-time catalogers need companies like alert sites that kind of have the language of the Internet baked into their DNA. Ken? Thank you, Carrie. Uh, my name is Ken Godskin, and as mentioned, I'm the VP of Monitoring Products for the Alert Site Division of SmartBear Software. And Alert Site is actually quite a you know, a, a seasoned company. We were founded in 1998, and we became a part of SmartBear in the beginning of April last year. Uh, being a part of SmartBear has really increased our, you know, our pace of innovation, I think, as an organization. Uh, SmartBear's products as a whole ensure uh, software success and web and cloud application success for more than 17,000 customers today with our end-to-end -end testing and monitoring solutions. And alert site services are all about measuring, um, measuring performance to help you deliver uh, user experiences that meet and exceed your, your clients' expectations. Uh, last year, uh, we became the number two provider of web performance monitoring to Internet retailers top 500 list and you know there's a lot of reasons for that um, we're the easiest to use completely browser-based solution that virtually eliminates scripting we offer uh, measurement from uh, 80 
locations around the globe today. And we also offer mobile monitoring, cloud monitoring, API and web service monitoring. But probably, um, you know, one of the most important things is that AlertSight as a monitoring service is easy, uh, provides advanced functionality, and is affordable to um, customers to utilize. Back to you, Kathy. Um, yeah, this slide basically is just going to give you a sense of how we got from here to there. Um, we, we are a small company, uh, relatively speaking, and when I arrived at SNS over 10 years ago, the site really at that point was nothing more than static HTML hosted entirely here on site in Colchester, Connecticut over what we thought was a fancy brand new T1 line. Um, for the next few years, we worked on building out an e-commerce back end. Um, and we saw a steady increase in our online business every year and things were good. Then all of a sudden during our busy season in the spring of 2009, we started getting lots of complaints from our own call center and from our customers that the site was horribly slow. And we could see that ourselves, uh, but we, didn't, we couldn't really tell where the pinch points were. Um, and we were pretty desperate for insight uh, and we signed a one-year contract with Gomez, who was a vendor I had seen in internet retailer publications. And for us, it was a pretty expensive solution. So we tried to sort of limit our costs by building long blackout windows into our monitoring. So basically, we didn't monitor our site performance during the evenings or on weekends. And we limited the number of locations from which we monitored our site. Wherever possible, we would fall back on our own sort of internal sort of on-site um, monitoring. And everything we did was aimed at sort of conserving and making efficient use of these expensive credits that we had bought. And we did have some immediate success, which I'll go over in the, in the next slide. Um, at that point, we were happy enough, but the following May, I met AlertSite at another internet retailer conference and I was amazed to discover that we could increase the monitoring frequency and locations and still reduce our costs by nearly a fourfold factor. So at that point, it was a no-brainer. We non-renewed with Gomez, and we've been with AlertSite ever since. Um, next slide. Um, what, what the monitoring basically showed us is that our pipe to the Internet was just plain too small. And since we're located on the East Coast, our West Coast customers were particularly affected. Um, on a dime, we couldn't just add more lines. So what we did was we opted to um, host sections of our site on Amazon S3, using it basically as a high-speed, inexpensive content delivery network. So literally overnight, we were able to move our JavaScript and CSS files up to S3 and turn on Apache compression, and it was a quick win. We were able to quickly reduce by about 30% the amount of content that we were serving on our own overloaded lines. And we were serving content uh, closer to the West Coast customers over a faster pipe. So it, it made a, a difference quickly for us. Um, then we went on to add, over the next year, more bandwidth um, and a load balancing appliance, and we started taking advantage of Apache's native load ba balancing capabilities, and we added additional servers. Um, today, uh, over 90% of our home page is actually hosted off-site, even though we retain control of the code base here on-site. Um, at the end of this February, we launched a long overdue, primarily cosmetic redesign of our entire site. We, we added a big carousel space on the home page, and we switched um, to Google web fonts for a more polished look. Um, and together, these two components increased the size of our home page. It caused it to balloon from uh, roughly 300K to 800K. Um, if we hadn't had long-standing um, performance metrics in place with AlertSight, it would have been a really scary thing to add that much bulk to the home page, um, but we did have those performance metrics in place, and we were able to see after launch that we didn't have any increase in our uh, performance warnings or errors. 
Um, as a matter of fact, uh, a few days after the launch on February 29th, we ran a big um, leap year sale that drove um, tons of traffic to the site, and, and we were able to weather that too. Ken has a, some analysis and a couple of slides that shows how this whole thing works, um, and I find it very interesting. Uh, this is a shot of our site before. Um, it was a three-column site. It had a lot of ad-like content. It was cluttered and busy, and no one was very happy with it. Um, but redesigning it by consensus was, was really hard because every little feature had a very vocal stakeholder. Uh, so finally, we just hired a consultant to redesign it for us. Um, and this new site um, emphasizes and incorporates um, our brand message, making it easy uh, throughout. And aesthetically, it's got an updated look. And we're, we're quite happy with the way it's been received. But from a technical perspective, as I said, um, it's a much larger home page. Um, and, uh, and it's just something we have to deal with. Next slide. And this is you. So um, one of the things that we worked together to do um, in preparation for the webinar was to do a little benchmarking of performance before and after the site relaunch. And you know this is probably a best practice um, for most organizations when they're making significant site changes is to really look carefully at the metrics pre and post. And in general, the metrics do show performance improvements. Um, while the key goal or objectives of the uh, website improvements were to provide richer content that improves the brand image and aesthetics. There also was an improvement in uh, raw site speed. At the same time, the size of the page um, increased from about 330K to around 800K, although the number of resources went down somewhat. And if you look at the graph here on this page, what we're looking at is uh, 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 execution times, transaction execution times for the checkout transaction for before and after. And we can see here that there was a slight decrease basically from about 17 seconds to about 16 and a half seconds for overall execution of the checkout transaction. So as Carrie had mentioned, you know, site speed improved slightly or didn't increase even though the, the site uh, content became richer. And then again, looking at the same page load, you know, those traditional waterfall report metrics for the home page showed an improvement from 3.7 seconds to about 3.5 seconds. What, what I think is really significant here, and we'll talk more about this in uh, later slides, is that Alert Site has added to the repertoire of the data that we collect to begin collecting more metrics that help our users really triangulate user experience and not just the raw page load metrics. One of those metrics that was recently added to the system is the DOM load timing. The DOM load and page load metrics are user experience metrics that are emitted by the web browser as they're rendering the web pages. and the DOM load um, metric in particular is, as a rule of thumb, is widely considered the point in time at which the web page becomes responsive to an end user. And so what I really find um, interesting here, even though the core, uh, core principles or objectives behind the, the new site was to improve aesthetics, was if you analyze this uh, when the page first becomes responsive to the user, there was actually an improvement of more than 30%. So these numbers for the home page went from about 2.65 seconds to around 1.85 seconds. So Im improvements, you know, improvements in performance are really you know wonderful in and of themselves. But but the reason that we strive to make those improvements, their real purpose is to improve the business metrics. And um, Carrie is going to tell us a little bit more about improvements in the business metrics. Yeah, so obviously we were anxiously waiting after the, um, the site launch to see how our customers responded to the new design, because for us it was a fairly radical makeover. 
Um, and we were really encouraged, and, it, and it's still um, early going. Our, our busy season is coming up, and we'll be in it for the next few months. But the preliminary results um, are that people like it. We focus on our natural search visitors, um, because those are customers who, in all likelihood, don't already know us. They're not our traditional customers. They've found us on Google. Um, and among those people, we saw um, the session length um, increased by 60 seconds. Uh, the buyer to visitor conversion rate increased uh, half a percent. For us, that was um, the highest point it had been in the uh, past 28 weeks and higher than any point in, in, during the same time period in the previous year. Um, and, our, and significantly, our bounce rate dropped an average of 3 to 5 percent. Um, those were metrics that we really hadn't been able to impact in, sub in, in previous attempts to improve. So for us, it was very encouraging. Um, I want to talk um, a little bit about um, what we actually use AlertSite to monitor and how we do that. Um, our monitoring transaction um, is, is a five-step process. It simulates a customer coming to our site, searching for a particular item, adding it to their cart, and entering the first step of our secure checkout process. Um, and by using that five-step process, we're not only keeping an eye on our overall site response time, but we're ensuring that critical site functionality like search and secure checkout is all working properly. And if a step fails for any reason, we're alerted and we can actually see a screenshot of what the user would have seen. Um, prior to monitoring, before we were using it, we had an incident where we bounced the site and we checked that it was up and working and all was great, but we neglected to check that our secure checkout was working and it wasn't. Um, that wouldn't have happened if we were using alert site. We would have been notified. Um, another thing that uh, we had to re-record our transaction to accommodate our new site, this five-step process when we redesigned it. Um, that's something we hadn't had to do in two years. Um, it, was, it was very straightforward, uploading the script. It, it took a matter of seconds. Um, when we were using our previous monitoring service, that always involved a call to customer service for assistance, and it, it was never a, a fun process. So I'd like to add a little bit to uh, monitoring the key transaction stuff, maybe to talk, to start by talking a little bit to best practices and follow up on what Carrie said, which is a, a big shift that I've seen over the last several years is really a move for most um, online stores to begin looking at ensuring store functionality. Um, kind of like we talked about last slide, making sure that the front door is working, whether that's landing pages or the home page, making sure that product search is working fast, making sure that um, you know you can pull a product up in the product catalog, add it to the cart, and begin the checkout. Um, but if you if you look at also what's happening, you know, with browser fragmentation. In fact, we had some news last week about uh, recent stat counter data. They report uh, browser usage data that uh, on the weekend of March 16th, there was actually a brief period where Chrome usage overtook IE usage in terms of page views across the internet. And so, so one of the things that we do really well here at AlertSite is we measure performance and availability with real browsers. Um, we've supported Firefox in our environment for a very long time. Um, Last year, we began supporting Internet Explorer 8 in our environment, and we're rolling out Chrome in the June time frame to customers. And of course, there's a lot of a lot of data pointing to you know momentum behind Chrome. In fact, I thought I saw some news uh, a couple of weeks back about Hillary Clinton announcing that uh, the Department of State will be moving to Chrome as well. So, so what about using real browsers to to monitor site performance? is important. Well, one thing is it makes it incredibly fast and easy to create transactions. There's virtually no no scripting is required. And we, you know, we interact with the application at that user layer, not at the protocol layer. So we're using the menus, entering data into the search forms and clicking add to cart buttons to make sure that 
store functionality is actually working and not just back-end services. Another key point is that one recording plays back in any browser, so the service does not require a separate recording for each browser that you want to monitor with. And finally, we offer a facility in the service called Test on Demand, which allows you to run instant testing and diagnostics. Basically, when you invoke Test on Demand, you get to watch the transaction that you're calling play back from any of the locations on our network, but you see it on your desktop screen by screen as it's playing back, and you get a detailed report um, when, when that execution completes so you can really see all of the metrics. <clears throat> now, for many of us, uh, managing third-party content has really become an important part of what we do. It's amazing how interconnected our sites have become, and oftentimes these content delivery network partners, syndicated data like product reviews, ad networks for rotating images like DoubleClick, visitor tracking, social networks. Um, you know, the third-party content is everywhere, and tracking and understanding how specific third-party content is impacting performance and user experience is critical as now we're, you know, we're working in such a complex web application delivery supply chain. So, you know, there's this, a lot of times with vendors you need to manage your relationship with them and part of the definition of your relationship with them is covered by an SLA or a service level agreement that defines the level of service that you can expect. Um, what's, what's probably the best example of you know, things that, or the most common example of things that I've heard from customers related to managing third party content is the challenge that you know, I really don't want to be alerted at two or three in the morning because an ad provider's call on one of our web pages wasn't successful or, or um, something like that. So, so managing third-party content has become you know, a requirement, I think, for many of us. And Carrie's going to talk a little bit about how they work with third parties. Yeah, so in today's world, it's really not possible to be an isolationist. Your website is going to have <laughs> content from multiple providers. Um, on any given page that we have, we have up to seven partners, um, six of whom could could directly impact um, the customer experience on our site. Um, in, in the process of preparing for this webinar, we finally went ahead and we established content views so we could, I, I'd heard about them for a long time, but we had never um, gone ahead and set them up. But we went ahead and set them up. And now we can see um, in, in a uh, isolated view for each of our partners, um, we have our customer reviews, which are handled by a third party. We've got um, integrations with Google for our fonts. We've got uh, storage up on Amazon. We have our live chat provider. Um, we've got, our obviously, our web analytics provider. And we've got um, our ad network, our remarketing provider, um, all of whom have hiccups from time to time. Um, if they hiccup once, we ignore it. If they hiccup twice, um, and this is an example on this slide, of our web analytics um, loading slowly, we would um, be, we would be able to get in contact with our web analytics provider and report the problem. Um, oftentimes, they're already aware of it because we're not the first ones. Um, other, sometimes we are the first ones. Um, they they turn around and they rattle the cage of the person who's hosting their CDN. Obviously, they're hopefully got more clout than we do. Um, and so we're able to react in a timely manner um, to outages. We have, in cases where we can't resolve them quickly, we've built in mechanisms where we can switch off the third party um, dependencies, sometimes limiting, um, like for example, we can serve images locally on our own servers if Amazon is having a protracted problem. Um, so we've developed uh, workarounds that we can turn on quickly in the event that we need to. So I'd like to talk for a minute about really understanding what true 
user experience means. Of course, the you know our objectives with our websites are to deliver these outstanding user experiences, to build loyalty, and take advantage of every shopper that comes to the site. And we all know from from our experiences that speed matters. Um, it impacts bounce rates, it impacts conversion rates, it impacts order sizes, it impacts time on site, it impacts that general feel of satisfaction. And you know, you can pick exactly what speed number works for you. What I find really interesting is the bigger question that uh, we face at alert site as we roll new features into the product to support uh, providing better metrics to help customers really triangulate user experience is the question, what does speed really mean today? Um, and what are the right performance metrics to look at? If we, <clears throat> if we look at the left side of the chart up here, these metrics are really, they're those tr that traditional view of web performance, those full page load metrics that is probably represented best by the waterfall report that we've many times seen um, that represent page load times. And these metrics, they're, they're very network centric. They focus on how long it takes to get all of the uh, uh, web page assets into the browser. And so they do have a value. You know, they're the metrics that we've been looking at for a very long time. But, but they, in and of themselves, don't help you really triangulate user experience, as we all know that applying some of the page optimization techniques that we learn from tools like Wiseflow or PageSpeed will oftentimes not greatly impact technical performance, but will begin to have impacts on perceived performance. So I'd like to categorize these more traditional metrics as network-oriented metrics and then talk to two new kinds of metrics that we've introduced to the service. The first is available to all accounts today, and these are the metrics that the browser emits as it's loading the page. That DOM load metric about when the browser has kind of parsed all the HTML and put it into the appropriate browser structure, and the page load metric about when the browser feels the page has been completely loaded for the user. So we're bringing together in the product today that traditional technical performance or full page performance with the browser user experience metrics. <coughs> Another really interesting perspective, which the initial data shows may have an even bigger impact on how we understand perceived performance, <laughs> is metrics that I'll call the user perspective of metrics. And so it's page optimizations often have the biggest impact on when the page first becomes visible to the user and when the page is completed loading above the fold. So these two new metrics, uh, while, while kind of the development work is done, are being integrated into Alert Site today and will be available in Alert Site's products for customers um, around June. So I thought I would take an example here of an actual measurement from the dev lab of SNS Worldwide's homepage that really brings together the full page time. So the full page time for this sample came in at about four and a half seconds. It's probably not a surprise that's a little slower. Um, you know, here than average because this is running from our dev lab and we're not as well connected as um, the monitoring stations. So there could have been some contention. So the full page time, the time that we have traditionally looked at all these years is about four and a half seconds. The browser user experience metrics show that the page was first responsive to the user a little after three seconds and that the browser thought the page was completed at 4.2 seconds. What I found even more interesting here and what you can see in these two example screenshots is the perceived performance metrics from the user's perspective, and this functionality will be released into the product in June, showed that this screen, so the first tenth of a second following initial page painting activity, 
happened at 0.8 seconds, and at that point users saw this screen, and then the rest of the page began to render in there, and that the page completed loading above the fold, meaning in the visible portion of the browser screen, in just a second and a half. So, so a very interesting you know, set of metrics to help you triangulate real user experience and to understand what your goals are in, as a site operator, I would, I would tell you that from my perspective, I have to believe that when you're trying to look at delivering great experiences to the user, it's the stuff that impacts their perception of performance and not necessarily the stuff that impacts the technical performance in itself that may be more meaningful to, to key on. So just trying to bring this all together for everybody and review the best practices again. When making significant site changes, it's really important to do some before and after benchmarking, not just on the website performance metrics, but also the business performance metrics, because you want to make sure there's nothing, you know, nothing getting lost in the transition there. And also, you want to make sure that you're not just monitoring is the site up, but are all the moving parts of the store working, you know, the, the, the stuff that leads up to the purchase, the search, the product catalog, the add to cart, the checkout, maybe authentication, ensuring that basically you're jiggling each moving part of the store and that you're clear about what levels of service are being delivered to end users for that. And then, of course, today we all have the challenge of managing uh, the array of third-party content and vendors that are participants in our user experience. And while we may be outsourcing some parts of the content of our site to them, it's still our job to be good stewards for the level of experience that's being delivered to end users. And of course, you want to pay attention to perceived performance as well as technical performance as we introduce these new metrics to the marketplace and make them available to users. And finally, you want to partner with a solution provider that meets your unique needs, not only for the functionality that you're looking for today, but what you might need for tomorrow, and can also present an efficient use of your financial and time resources in terms of a total cost of ownership for both you know, paying for the monitoring that you need and you know, efficiently managing the process of you know, setting up and managing transactions. Uh, obviously, there's lots of choices that all of you have in the marketplace, and you want to try to make sure that what you're using is easy, advanced, and affordable. So at Thanks, this point, Ken. I think. At this time, yeah, we'll open up for um, questions. So we'll allow a few minutes for questions to continue to trickle in through the chat window. And um, then I'll direct them to Carrie and Ken as appropriate. OK, Carrie, um, there is a question for you. Uh, you mentioned that you saved money when you switched from Gomez. What did you give up in terms of functionality? Um, in terms of important functionality, we didn't really give up anything. Um, one thing, one feature that Gomez had that we were attempting to make use of is something I think I think their term for it is actual experience or something like that. But what you do is you actually put um, tags on your own web page and you sample portions of your traffic and they can give you statistics on, on the, the end user um, experience. It's not, it's not a synthetic monitoring, it's not from a, a fixed monitoring location, but it's actually to that user's desktop. Um, but you have to pay for it and so you have to make decisions about how much of your traffic you're going to sample. And in our case, we were sampling a very small percentage of our traffic because that's all we could afford. Um, now, we did get data that was, was interesting in kind of a gee whiz sort of way, but um, when I actually thought, well, so what are we going to do with this information, um, you know, I, I think, I'm, I, hopefully I'm speaking to an audience of sort of similar people. We're not a huge company with, with endless resources, 
though we didn't have a lot of time to scrutinize it or take action based on it or, or even understand it. So, so we did give that up, but uh, you know, on a day in and day out basis, it wasn't really adding value um, from our perspective. Okay, uh, Ken, a question for you. Why is there such a difference between the traditional metrics that you talked about for page load versus the new perceived metrics? You know, I think that's a, a really good question. And um, I guess the best thing I could do is give an example of, you know, I think all of us probably have visited, let's say, you know, Amazon's website. And of course, it's a very uh, content-rich website. And probably we've all noticed that, you know, when you when you type in Amazon.com, that page is visible in your browser in, I, I mean, it it almost seems like it's hard to notice, but roundabouts a second. And then, you know, if you look at those more traditional um, waterfall report metrics for a page like Amazon, it really loads in about three and a half seconds. And I think the real difference here is the difference between literal performance, how long does it take to load each and every asset or resource that's a part of your web page, and how long does it take to load the parts that provide uh, the, the resources that are needed to paint in the visible space. For example, I'm sure many of us have gone to a web page. The web page looks loaded in a second or two in our browser, but you can watch the lower left-hand corner and you can see that the browser is still chugging through resources and making data requests for assets that are perhaps lower down in the page or perhaps they're the kind of third-party things that happen, you know, uh, post-page onload event. So I think the real differences are there that one is looking at how long it takes to load the page in completeness from that traditional technical perspective, and one is really focusing more on perceived performance in terms of above the fold. Yeah, can, well, I, can, um, I, can I add one thing to that question? Because we do have, I, I mentioned that we have seven um, partners on our web page, um, and six of whom can directly impact our uh, page performance load time. But one of our partners, um, our, our remarketing provider, they load sort of asynchronously in an iframe um, apart from our core page performance. So we frequently see um, that the metrics from that site chugging away, chugging away, um, but but it doesn't actually impact the performance of our page itself. Thanks, Carrie. Um, and Carrie, maybe you can answer this question um, because you mentioned I think that increased session length was one metric that you looked at um, and, and deemed an improvement in your new site. But a question came in, why do you link increased session length to improvement? Could it just be that users can't find what they're looking for? It absolutely could be, and I think any one metric in isolation, maybe apart from conversion rate, um, you, you have to dig into what's behind it. Um, so w the, the metric I actually take more comfort in is, is bounce rate, um, people coming to our site, looking around, and leaving without clicking one more time. Um, I, I sort of interpret session length as um, I want to... I, you, it, it's a glass half empty or half full. In this case, I want to take it as a, as an indication that they're they're looking around and they're and they're checking out the new site. But I, in and of itself, yeah, I agree with the questioner that that's not a metric of success. Thanks. Uh, Ken, a question for you: Does the SmartFair Alert Site tool use tagging or require you to tag your page? So the the alert site monitoring is is synthetic monitoring, meaning it's basically uh, you know a robot that uh, uses a real web browser to play through those user events and then observe how your application is responding in real web browsers and record that for you. So today, the technology that we use for monitoring requires no web page tagging, no uh, special work that has to be done with the source code of your application or anything like that. Thanks. Um, another question for Ken. 
Do you have any statistics on how many visitors you might lose from your online store for every increased second of load time? So there are some statistics on um, averages in terms of time on site and page viewed and conversion rates. But the statistics that I actually have are from an Aberdeen paper in 2008. And I think they're, they're kind of dated. So I'd be happy to share them with you by email. But I, I think they are probably you know, need updation with some more relevant um, um, research. But I think there was you know, a pretty significant uh, improvement in each of those metrics statistically for each second of improvement that you had um, in the website. And from a webinar that we did uh, last year with a customer where they implemented website changes where they had a two-second improvement in actual response time, they saw an almost doubling in you know, conversion rates and average order sizes on their site. Thank you. Um, like there's one more question coming in. What would you do for flows that require rights to our database from an order perspective? We cannot submit orders due to revenue concerns. Hmm. So that's actually a very common, you know, common challenge that that um, online retailers have. And there's really two, two perspectives about going about how you manage that from a monitoring perspective. The first perspective says, look, we, we really would prefer not to have to do any cleanup or have any sort of what I would call dummy products in the system that we can order without affecting our real store operations. So many, many stores will walk the path right up to confirming the order and then not finalize the transaction. However, especially if you know the e-commerce system that they're running on is not really under their full control, like it's a, you know, a software as a service provider kind of thing. Although I will tell you, I have had customers that will actually insert a special product in the system that's used to um, <clears throat> as the the checkout product, or customers that have picked an item that is rarely ordered and then um, gone back and you know used special identifiers like the name of the customer or the address or something to ensure that those orders are never officially processed. But those are the two the two strategies that I've seen employed in practice. Yeah, we did. We did have one, um, one incident where uh, we I can't remember who it was, but somehow the um, the IPs of the monitoring agent changed, and we had neglected to tell our um, analytics provider to exclude those metrics from the from our stats. And we had like about a week and a half of like panicking that we had a huge spike in our um, checkout traffic um, until we realized that it was just our monitoring that when we were forgetting to ignore it. Oops. <laughs> Thanks. Another question, does SmartBear do cross-browser testing? So that's, that, that's an interesting question. So, so today, you know, uh, SmartBear as a whole has many tools that help with the testing and QA process. And the tool that most customers use for QA testing and cross-browser testing is another product in the family called Test Complete. What AlertSight does very well is cross-browser monitoring. And so for that, today we're supporting Firefox 10, Internet Explorer 8, and probably the latest version of Chrome when we add Chrome to the monitoring network in June. Thank you. It appears that that uh, is the end of the questions that were submitted for today. So I want to thank everybody for participating in the webinar. Um, everyone who has joined will receive a link to a recording and also a copy of today's slides. 
So um, again, we thank you, and we'll follow up in the next few days. Have a great afternoon.